Do you know what a central bank digital currency is or how a CBDC might actually work? Plenty of people are talking about CBDCs today, but most people don't understand how it's actually different from money today. Because as we look around and we make our payments, and we get our paychecks and we send money, it's all digital anyway. So what is the difference between today's money and a central bank digital currency? And why is it that I always say that a CBDC is a tyrant's wet dream? Ready? Let's dive in. There are four types of money that have been used throughout history or that potentially might be used in the future. One of them is commodity money. Another one is commodity backed money. Another one is private ledger money. And another one is public ledger money. These are the only four types of money that might exist or have existed in the past. So let's start off with commodity money. This is very simple. This is seashells, this is gold coins, this is silver coins. This is the way that the world has operated for thousands of years up until relatively recently. You've got your gold coins, your silver coins, your copper coins, and you trade them for goods and services. The commodity itself is the money. Number two, we have commodity backed money, and this is relatively newer within just the last couple thousand years, and it's become more and more popular throughout the more recent history up until a few hundred years ago. And this is where banks, whether it's a local private bank, a central bank, has the gold in storage, the silver in storage, the commodity in a vault, and they give you a piece of paper that says, hey, you can come get that commodity at any time. So instead of the commodity actually trading as money, something else trades as money as a proxy for that commodity. And so that paper trades and the paper is the money, but at any time you can go get the actual commodity so that paper is backed by the commodity. This type of a system became extremely popular a little over a thousand years ago and centralized more and more and more until it failed in 1971 when the last commodity backed monetary system, the gold exchange standard that started in Bretton Woods, ended in 1971 when the United States closed the gold window. This meant that all the pieces of paper that were circulating around the world that said, hey, you can go get your gold from the United States government if you want, ceased to be redeemable for the commodity and the paper became the money by itself. This led to a hybrid of the two systems over the last 50 years between commodity money and commodity backed money, but instead of gold being the commodity, debt became the commodity. And so at the foundation, instead of having gold that money was created off of, you have US government treasuries, you have government bonds, government debt as that foundation that then dollars are printed off of. And so you have paper dollars that act like a commodity themselves because you can trade that actual paper as money and it's not redeemable for anything. But in the financial system, digitally speaking, the debt layer is the foundation layer, which acts just like the gold commodity used to. Now, this has obviously led to many, many problems over the last 50 years, many global financial crises, episodes of hyperinflation, sovereign debt defaults and other financial crises for the last 50 years. Many people are now calling for a new monetary system. Some people are pushing for a public ledger monetary system. Some people are pushing for a return to real commodity money. And some people are pushing for private ledger money. So let's talk about those last two that we haven't talked about yet, public and private ledger money, starting with public ledger. The current common example of public ledger money is Bitcoin. But in order to understand Bitcoin, we have to go look at the original Bitcoin, Rye Stones. These were large donut shaped rocks that the Micronesian island people used as money. Now you might be thinking, hey, wait, this sounds a lot like a commodity money, not so fast. These were about eight feet tall, sometimes larger, sometimes a little bit smaller, which meant you couldn't exactly put one in your pocket and take it to the store and slap it down on the counter. No, these were public ledger money examples because the entire village, the entire community had a verbal and mental agreement on who owned these stones. So there's one big stone in the middle and John owns that stone. Now, if John wants to buy a cow, he needs to get the island together and he says, hey, I am transferring ownership of this rock 
to Phil, and Phil's going to give me his cow. And now the entire island says, yep, now Phil owns the rye stone and John owns the cow. This meant that theft of money was virtually impossible with a public ledger system like this because you couldn't just say, oh, hey, I own that rock now instead of you because the entire village community would say, uh, no, you don't. We all know that he still owns that. You're not going to put it you know, in your pocket and drive away with it. It's a giant eight foot tall stone. And so it's a ledger system because it's basically a list. The entire community understands there's a verbal and mental agreement on who owns all of these large stones. And that's all a ledger is. It's just a list that has a record of who owns how much, and it's public because everybody is aware of it at the same time. Bitcoin is just like this. It's the digital version of this type of monetary system. Anybody can go look and see all of the Bitcoin wallets that have a certain, any amount of Bitcoin, see how much they have, and see where those Bitcoins came from before they were in those wallets, all the way back to the very beginning. It's like an Excel spreadsheet sheet that everybody has a link to access, but nobody has a link to edit. Everybody has a link and looks and sees, OK, this amount of money tr got transferred from John to Phil and then from Phil back to John. And we can see all the transactions back to the beginning and every single wallet that has money. It's a public ledger, a public list. And I know that's been a long lead up, but we have to understand those types of money in order to really grasp what a central bank digital currency is and how it works, because it is a private ledger monetary system. This means that it is not a commodity money where there is an actual physical thing in a vault. It is not a commodity backed money where you can go redeem your money for something of value. It is also different than a fiat currency like we have today, which is a hybrid, a monster Frankenstein hybrid between a commodity money and a commodity backed money based on debt because you don't have any foundation of that monetary system system built on government treasuries, government debt. A central bank digital currency instead is like Bitcoin, but instead of it being a public ledger, it's the exact opposite. It's a private ledger. So imagine now I have an Excel spreadsheet. And this Excel spreadsheet has one row for every single person in the country. And in every single row, I can see who has any amount of money and how much they have and any transactions that have taken place between any of the accounts, the rows on my spreadsheet. But the key thing here is that it's private. So you can't see this spreadsheet. Just me as the central bank, the Federal Reserve. I'm the only one that can see this. Not only am I the only one that can see this, but I actually have control over this spreadsheet as well. I can edit this spreadsheet. Nobody would know and nobody can stop me. This means that if I want to, if I decide to give somebody some extra money, I can do that. I can just go into the Excel spreadsheet and it say instead of a hundred dollars, you now have a thousand dollars. Instead of a billion dollars, you now have a trillion dollars. It also means that I can subtract money from any account. Instead of $100,000, you now have $50,000. So unlike a public ledger where everybody can see it, therefore nobody can control it or hack it or steal it or change amounts because everybody would know and put a stop to it, a private ledger centralizes all the control over that list there is no tie to any commodity, any debt, and so I can exercise full control over any account, credits and debits. Mayor Amschel Rothschild was credited with a quote, give me control of a nation's money and I care not who writes the laws. The more you can control the money, the more you can control everything. This is because money makes up half of everything. Every single thing you do all day long, whether it's work, driving somewhere, eating, sleeping in a home that you rent or have your mortgage on, everything you do, the other side of that is money. So the more control you can exercise over the money, the more control you can exercise over everything. You virtually have totalitarian control over every action and every decision and the flow of all resources in an economy. This is why a CBDC is a tyrant's wet dream. You've got all the possible data, You've got all the power to make any decision you want, and you've got the control to actually enforce that decision. You think people shouldn't spend as much on gas? 
You can stop that. You think that people of a certain race or ethnicity or gender or minority group need more money? You can just credit them some more money. You want to stimulate spending? You can give people money that it would expire. You think inflation's getting out of control? You can just debit people's accounts. Full control, no accountability. Now, I get it. Just because the potential to abuse power exists doesn't mean that power will be abused. So if you want to know the likelihood of that happening, all you'd have to do is study history. And I can guarantee you one thing, the more you study history, the less you'll trust in governments. As always, I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.